It was a traffic jam. There were cars piled up everywhere. It was move-in day, my freshman year of college. There were some U-Hauls. There were pickup trucks. There were minivans. There were SUVs. There were two-door Honda Civics like mine that were cram-packed full of clothes and belongings, and there was the car next to mine, my parents' car, and there were no elevators where I lived. It was just stairs. Luckily, it was only the second floor, but it was hot, and there was no air conditioning in the building. And we finally got all the things out of our cars, got our cars parked, then we started to range my room. My allergies had started. My, my nasal, I, I just feel, I just feel congestion. And so I began to rub my eye because my eyes began to itch. And my mom, in a scene straight out of a Hallmark or Lifetime movie, in a moment that mothers long for, especially when their children are 18 years old, looked at me. And just channeling her inner Margaret Thatcher, Some of you have no idea who Margaret Thatcher is. <laughs> Looked at me. Mary Poppins, maybe you saw the new one that came out. It wasn't as good as the original. I don't know. Anyway, she looked at me with just the look of only a mother could give. And I, I feel like she, she just clenched her fist a little bit just for even more effect. Just shook her head in a gaze of pride and hope and said, it's okay to cry if you need to. <laughs> and I responded to this moment by laughing in my mother's face <laughs> and said, cry? I'm not sad at all that you're leaving. I said, my eyes are itching from allergies. Now, for those of you who are like, oh, that cuts so deep, you have to understand something. I'm the second child, so I get it, all right? The first kid, yeah. If the first kid says those words to their mother, therapy, years of therapy. But I'm the second child. By that point, it's, ah, we've done this before. Get out of here. Who cares? And by this point in time, they're just like, yes, empty nest. So I really don't feel that bad about my response. But I just looked at her and said, I'm fine. They took me to dinner, which for those of you who have gone to college or are heading to college soon know the last meal you can get on your parents' dime is a feast. It's a feast. Even if you're not the buffet type, you find a buffet and you eat like there is no tomorrow because it's really the last supper and you're going to be in for a world of hurt. And then you've got to pay from there on out. So I'm talking steak and lobster and crab legs. Put it on the parents tab because pretty soon it's just going to be pizza and leftover pizza and then cold chicken nuggets that somebody bought six hours ago, but they still have some laying on their desk in their room. And you're like, yeah, I don't see anything on it. That's fine. No dipping sauce, no worry. You aren't going to have to worry about it. We had our last supper, and then they left. And I got back to my dorm room, and I made it before my roommate. And then the thought hit me. What's next? What's next? For the first time in my life, I was pseudo on my own. And there I sat in my dorm room, and for the first time, I, I really didn't know anybody. And there, were some, there was a schedule of events that you could go to, but I had freedom to decide what I would go to and what I would skip. And I had this question of what now? What steps do I take? What do I do? Maybe you feel that way, or maybe you have felt that way in your spiritual journey. Maybe even for some, it was last Sunday, right in this place, or another time recently, or, or maybe for some of you, you made the decision to follow Jesus so many years ago, it's hard to think back, but, but try to think back, and all right, now you've made the decision. You've made the decision to follow Jesus. You've heard his promises. You've seen him for who he is and what he has done for you. And the question now is what's next? Now that I've made the decision to follow Jesus, now that I've become a Christian, what do I do? And this morning we're going to look at that. 
And we're going to see the story of a man named Philip. And it's recorded for us in Acts chapter 8. So if you have your Bible apps on your phones or on your tablets, you can follow along there. And if you haven't downloaded it yet, make sure you do soon. But you can follow along on the screens as we start in Acts 8, 26, where we read these words. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. So this is the instruction that was given to Philip by an angel. Now earlier in Acts 8, and we don't have time to look at that this morning, but you can, you can look this up later today or during some Bible study this week. Earlier in Acts 8, what we see is Philip is in Samaria. Philip is in Samaria, and he has seen God work incredible wonders. They're in a city, and they are seeing countless number of people turn their lives to Jesus. And in that work, he's in the midst of that, just a thriving ministry in the city of Samaria, and God's angel shows up to Philip, and he says, Hey, go on a road to a desert. Go on a road to a desert. What we have to understand is bigger isn't always better or more important in God's economy. Bigger isn't always better or more important in God's economy. And here is Philip in a city, in a ministry that's having immense success, and God calls him to go on a road that leads to a desert. And he rose and went, verse 27 says. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. So here's Philip. He is having immense success in Samaria. God's angel shows up, calls him to go to a desert road, and he has an encounter with an Ethiopian eunuch. Now understand in those days there was a strategy involved when an army would come and conquer a land. They would go through and they would rape and pillage oftentimes that that land. They would kill a number of people, and those they didn't kill, they would castrate and then use them for their service. That was the strategy of conquering kingdoms in those days. Just incredibly brutal acts by our armies. And most likely, this Ethiopian was was taken captive in a coup or in in a battle, and he was then castrated and used for service for the Ethiopian queen, Candace. And understand this. Being that he's in charge of all the treasure of the queen of Ethiopia, he's basically the CFO of the Ethiopian royal family. And so here's this Ethiopian eunuch, and he's spiritually seeking. He's dealt with trauma. He's dealt with trauma. He's been castrated. He's dealt with horrible, just horrifying events in his past. And for those of you who have dealt with horrible, horrifying events in your past, you know that they leave a mark and they leave a scar. And the question is, what do you do with that? Do you ignore it? Do you hope it goes away? Do you try therapy? Do you mask it with substances just to try to forget the pain? Events in our lives can haunt us and they cut deep. And they can leave us at a place where we have to question things because of what we've had to endure. And there's no doubt in my mind that he's spiritually seeking. And part of that's designed because of what he's had to endure. Things that no one should have to go through. And maybe you've been there. And maybe in that hurt you've wondered, God, where are you in all of this? Why would you allow this? If you're good and if you exist and if you love, then how could you allow these things to happen? And how could you allow me to go through them? Where are you? 
These things can rattle us. And they lead us to a path where we have to ask questions. And if you're there and you're searching, I want you to know God is not scared by your questions. Your questions are not wrong. And I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for some of the things that you've had to endure. And I don't have all the answers that can easily placate you. I can talk to you theologically, and I can give you a theological answer about the goodness of God and the power of freedom and why there's good and there's evil. But at the core, that does very little to solve the hurt. I'm more than happy to provide the theological answer, but I'm also more than happy just to sit with you and let you cry. Or scream. Process however that could be. But he's also a CFO. Of the Ethiopian royal family. And for those of you who've been down that quest, you know that that too can leave you searching. You start with the dream, you start with the idea, and then you taste it. And it tastes sweeter than you thought it ever would. And then you just want more. And then you get more, but all of a sudden the sweetness is gone. And now you're in a machine, and you're trapped in a machine, and you're running a machine. And more, more, more doesn't always feel better. But even more than that, you've noticed that there's this void within you that you thought, as soon as you experienced success, would be taken care of. But you're lonelier than you've ever been. You're more frustrated than you've ever been. You have more stress, worry, and anxiety than you ever thought possible. And you go back to the dream, you go back to the plan, and you say, this this isn't what it was supposed to be. This isn't what I signed up for. This looks radically different, and that too, immense success, can lead you to a place where you're searching. And here, in one individual... We have the trauma of unspeakable acts happening to him in his life. We have immense power and success. And we have someone who's empty and seeking. And I wonder, is that you? For whatever reason, is that true of you? And the Spirit, it says in verse 29, said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. God called, and Philip ran. God called Philip away from what everybody would look out from the exterior and say, this was incredibly successful. And God said, get out of Samaria and go to the desert. This makes no sense from the human standpoint. This makes no sense when we look at it. But God's plan doesn't always reveal itself to us in a way that naturally makes sense according to our thinking. God called and Philip ran. He ran to the desert road. He ran over to an individual that he didn't know to just listen to God and be willing to be used by God. And so my question for those of you who follow Jesus is simply this this morning. What is God calling you to and are you running to it or are you running from it? What is God calling you to, and are you running to it, or are you running from it? And make no mistake, indifference is running from. 
You may say, well, I'm not, I'm not really running. I'm just not doing anything to further it. Make no mistake, you might as well be running. In fact, you may be even in a more dangerous place than if you were just in full rebellion because you may convince yourself, I'm okay. I'm not going to be fully obedient to God, but I'm just not going to run into what God is calling me to do. And I promise you, if that's you and if that's where you are right now, you will miss the most fulfilled life you could ever possibly have if you would run to what God is calling you to. What is God calling you to do? And make no mistake, if you're a follower of Jesus, the reason you're still here is God's not done with you. So what's he calling you to? And if you don't know, then find out. Engage his word. Spend time praying. Study the scriptures. Talk to people who are further along in their spiritual journey than you. Talk to people who aren't as far along in their spiritual journey as you are. But seek and search what God is calling you to do. If you've made the decision to follow Jesus, God has a plan for you. And God wants you to be engaged. Otherwise, you'd be dead. And you'd be with him. If you're not dead, you're not done. So find out what God wants for you. Let's make sure we're engaging people where they are. In the same way that Philip goes over to the Ethiopian eunuch. And he allows where he is to begin the process. Let's make sure that we too are willing to engage people where they are. That we're not threatened by honesty. That we don't have some preconceived mold or notion that everybody has to fit in in order for us to be effective. But that we are willing to meet people where they are with all their hurts, with all their hangups, with all their addictions, with all their messes, with all the things we see. And we're like, oh, God wants to go to work there. Let's make sure that we meet people where they are. Are, and not just to condemn and, con- and just, just to constantly try to change. Let's meet them where they are and try to point them to Jesus, but let it happen organically and on God's timetable and not our preconceived notions or on ours. We live in an age right now where people are incredibly curious about spiritual things. And you may have seen some of the research and some of the studies that that love to declare millennials are rejecting religion faster than any generation. And yet when you dig beyond the headlines, what you find is that 66% of millennials believe in God. Two-thirds believe in God. Now, is that something to celebrate? No. Scripture tells us even the demons believe in God. So we've got, we've got to take that belief, and we have to meet them at the place that they are and show them how to have a relationship with God. But understand, hope is not lost on this next generation. God is bigger than statistics. God is bigger than trends. And God's work is not done. God has been drawing people to himself through his son Jesus for thousands of years, and that work is going to continue. And the question The question that we have is, are we going to join him in that or not? This is not hopeless. In fact, the opportunities are everywhere. And that should energize us and excite us as a church that, yes, millennials are rejecting organized religion faster than any generation out there. But they are incredibly spiritual. And our challenge is to help them connect the path to God. And that's through a relationship with his son, Jesus. So let's make sure we run into the work that God is calling us. The passage continues. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. 
Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. He's reading from Isaiah 53. This is the prophecy of Jesus. That Jesus is the Messiah. That Jesus is God. That he is our sacrifice so we could have a relationship with God. That he paid the price for my sins and my mistakes and my faults and your sins and your mistakes and your faults. That he died on the cross. He rose again three days later. This is the message of the one who is to come. And the eunuch, verse 34, tells us, said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? He says, who is this about? And then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. He waited for the questions to happen organically. He didn't try to fit the conversation into a preconceived narrative. And this is how God Let's make sure that we're willing to be there when God is working. I know that this idea of talking about faith can be incredibly scary for some people. You're like, I don't have it all figured out. And the the reality is God never asked you to. Here's God's expectation for you that you would tell the story of what Jesus has done for you. 1 Peter tells us, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have. Start with your story. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to be able to debunk every critique or criticism that everybody has. You start with what God has done in you. How he's changed you. How he's given you hope. How he's enabled you to love. How he's set you free. How he's taken the hurt of the unspeakable things that have happened in your life. And he hasn't just completely taken those away, but he's done something even better. He's taken the hurt and he's transferred that hurt into hope. You take your story of how you set out goals for yourself and you just punch through every single goal you set for yourself and you experience more success than you ever imagined possible. And yet when you did, it felt so empty. And now you have success, but you have something even more important than success. You have purpose because of who Jesus is and what he's done for you. Philip shows him the hope of Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Now that he heard, now that he heard of Jesus, and now that he understood, he went to Jerusalem on a spiritual quest. He returned. He was still unfulfilled in much the same way that the generations around us right now are on a spiritual quest and anything apart from a relationship with Jesus will leave them still searching and will leave them unfulfilled. That is where the Ethiopian eunuch was. And then Philip intervenes and he reveals to him the truth of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And now that he has heard that message and now that he understands the immense love that God has for him. The message, he was ready to make it public. He understood. He adopted that message as his own. He sees it and he says, here's water. What's holding me back? Why shouldn't I be baptized? Understand this. Baptism is the public declaration of your decision. Baptism is the public declaration of your decision. If you've made the decision to follow Jesus, your next step is to be baptized. It's letting everybody know about the decision that you've made. And he commanded the chariot to stop, verse 38 says. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. This is a changed life. This is the story of someone who was unfulfilled finding fulfillment. 
This is a reminder that God cares about every single one of us, that he would call Philip out of a successful ministry that was reaching hundreds and thousands of people and lead him onto a desert road to have his life interact with the life of this Ethiopian. Make no mistake, God cares desperately for Every soul matters. Came up out of the water. Here at Lakeside, the way we baptize people is is by immersion. And it's okay if you don't understand what that means. We're we're just going to tell you. What that means is we literally take you and we dunk you. All right? So so think a pool party when you're in seventh grade and, and there's the cute girl that you're like really attracted to and you don't know how to flirt yet and you're like I'll just be mean to her like you know on the playground so you go over and you dunk her kind of something like that um but we'll we'll dunk even if we're not attracted to you for the record uh (laughs) but the reason that we baptize that way is we believe it's a beautiful symbol it's a beautiful symbol of Christ's death his burial and his resurrection It's a beautiful symbol that Scripture tells us at the moment we make the decision to follow Jesus, we are new creations. The old in us is dead. And there is new life and new birth as a result of Jesus changing us and giving us his spirit to come and to live within us. We also baptize this way because as we look throughout the book of Acts in the New Testament, we just see example after example of of it being done this way. So at Lakeside, we baptize by immersion, meaning we'll we'll dunk you under the water. And we also baptize post-conversion. Now, I understand a lot of people here may have been baptized as a little kid. And we're not angry about that fact. It's it's not something we practice here. We do something called child dedication and check out the e-newsletter and and announcements to come. We've got a new date for that this fall that we're going to be announcing soon. But we do something called child dedication because we believe that baptism is a symbol that happens after each person has made the decision to follow Jesus. And that's a personal decision. That's a personal. So we're not mad that your family wanted to point you into the direction of Jesus and had you baptized as a kid. We're not angry about that or anything else. We're really excited that you grew up in a family that wanted to point you to Jesus. We just believe, based on the New Testament, that the best, the best example of baptism happens when you're dunked under the water and it happens after you made the decision to follow Jesus. And the reason for that is Acts 2.41. 3,000 people baptized after they made the decision to follow Jesus. Acts 8, 12, Philip preaching to people in Samaria immediately before God called him down here to talk to the Ethiopian, baptized after they made the decision to follow Jesus. Acts 10, 48, baptism of the Gentiles after they made the decision to follow Jesus. Acts 16, 14 to 15, Lydia baptized after she was a follower of Jesus. Acts 16, 33, the Philippian jailer and his family baptized after they made the decision to follow Jesus. Acts 18.8, new believers in Corinth, they believed and were then baptized. Acts 19.5-6, new believers in Ephesus made the decision to follow Jesus, then were baptized. So that's the reason here at Lakeside we dunk you under, we think it's a beautiful picture, and that's why we baptize people after they personally have made the decision to follow Jesus. This is your next step if you've made the decision to follow Jesus. And on Sunday, September 8th, two weeks from today, if there's anyone here who's made the decision to follow Jesus but hasn't been baptized, I'm just asking, what's holding you back? What's preventing you? You might think, well, I, I don't have all the answers. I'm not that really that far along in my faith yet. And some people, if, if they, they could look at my life and say, well, that's not, that's, that's not where it needs to be, and this isn't where it needs. This has nothing to do with sanctification. This has nothing to do with you becoming more like Jesus. The Ethiopian 
moments after understanding the prophecy of Isaiah and understanding who Jesus is, sees water and says, what's stopping me? Your life doesn't have to be all together. We want your life to be all together. Don't misunderstand me. But don't let that hold you back. Don't let the fear of, well, I've waited a really long time. And now I, I wonder what people are going to think about me. Don't let that stop you. Let me tell you what people are going to think about you here at Lakeside. We're going to see you in that lake, being baptized by whoever has been instrumental in bringing you to Jesus. If, if you want me to baptize you, I'd be more than happy to. If you want somebody else here at Lakeside who's been instrumental in helping you become more like Jesus in that lake, we'll probably be freezing because it's Lake Michigan, and it's always cold, and it's September in Wisconsin, and so we're, we're not going to make an afternoon of this, all right? We're, we're in and out. That's, that's just the route we're going to do. And I know what some of you are already thinking. You're like, well, I would love to, but that's the kickoff to NFL season. Those games start at 12. Well, what I would say to you is the Packers play Chicago on Thursday night, September 5th, so you're not going to miss a Packer game. And again, it's Lake Michigan. You're going to be home by 12, all right? <laughs> We're done at 1030. We're out of that water not too long after there because I'm going to be real cold if anybody wants me to get in that water. And if not, that's fine. But you're going to be real cold if you're in that water. So it's down and we good. Let's go. Maybe a high five, a quick hug, a handshake, whatever. But that can be done while you're walking to the shore, all right? We'll have towels for you, all right? We'll make it as comfortable as we possibly can. But If you've made the decision to follow Jesus, this is the next step. It's a picture of what Jesus did. It's a picture of what Jesus has done in you. And it's a sign to let people know, I've made that decision. And we would love nothing more than to celebrate that with you. There aren't going to be any snide remarks. Nobody's going to be like, well, that took way too long. Or that was a lot of years coming. Or do you know what's going on in that person's life? No, 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 no. We don't care. What we care about is this person has made the decision to follow Jesus. And we're excited about that. And so if you haven't been, send us an email, office at lakeside-church.com. Send me an email, brian, with an I, at lakeside-church.com. But don't wait. And let's celebrate what Jesus has done together on September 8th. If you want to be baptized and you're like, I don't know how to email, we'll still dunk you. That's fine. We'll dunk you. Come talk to me after the service and we'll get your information. But if you've made the decision to follow Jesus, this is your next step. God, thank you for giving us hope. Thank you for being willing to take our hurts and our trauma and in a way that we can't fully explain but only you can do. Turn those into hope and healing. Thank you, God, for giving us purpose when all the success in the world and all of our dreams and all the things that we've aimed for and we've achieved leave us feeling empty. You're there to fill that void. Thank you, God, for caring about every single person. Every soul matters. So sometimes you call us to do things that people look at and just shake their heads because it makes no sense in their understanding. But in your economy, God, it makes perfect sense. And I pray right now for anyone here who's made the decision to follow you. I pray, God, that if they haven't taken this next step, that they would. That they wouldn't be hung up on anything. And God, that we as a community will celebrate and encourage and applaud their next step. Thank you for changing lives. Thank you for changing us.
Help us love. Help us be people who show hope. Help us be willing to meet with anyone and help them in their journey as they discover you. So God, let this be a place where people find you and they take their next steps in their relationship with you. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.